everyone and welcome to Inside Leather History of Fireside Chats. I'm Doug O'Keefe, the host and the producer of the chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today is May 23rd, 2022, and I'm having an interview with Cleo Dubois. Cleo is the widow of Fakir Musafar. She is an educator and a member of the Society of Janus. How are you, Cleo? I am doing just great, you know, wonderful warm day in uh, Northern California. That's and how are you? I'm great, thank you. Let's start right at the very beginning. Please tell me a little bit about where you're from, a little bit about your background. I was born and raised in the suburb of Paris, France, uh, of a family where there was a lot of drama, a lot of uh, abuse, um, psychological abuse, a little bit physical, not sexual abuse there. And um, my family was very, extremely right wing, the kind of right wing that we see raising here right now. Mm. So I went to Catholic school, girls only. Um, they were also very racist, as well as uh, anti-gay. So I would say my life <laughs> turned around completely the opposite of what they wanted me to be. Um, by the time I was 16, I decided to leave home and uh, stop going to school, even though I would have loved to become a philosophy teacher. That was my dream but I couldn't take living there anymore. And at 16, it's uh, allowed in France to leave your family. Mm -hmm. And I took typing and I started uh, taking care, you know, providing for myself. Um, by the, before I was uh, 21, uh, I um, moved to the state. Basically, I was attracted to the idea of sexual freedom, of happiness, of free love. I think that one song, uh, if you go to San Francisco, make sure to wear some flower in your hair. Actually, I wore a flower dress from India when, when I bought a flight that brought me to the state. Um, I had a lot of dreams. I was very adventurous. I was a little crazy because I really didn't know what to expect. I didn't speak English. Wow. I knew your basic, uh, your basic go to the blackboard, my tailor is rich, my tailor is not rich. Okay, I knew maybe, you know, where is that? How much does it cost? Uh, what time is it? But that was about it. And I had a friend who lived in Santa Barbara and at the time he had to get a visa to uh, visit the state and I asked him to invite me. So I had somebody to actually meet and I met him in Santa Barbara. And uh, that was in 1969, I hate to say. Oops, look, I had told my age to everybody. Oh, well, but so it is. Why San Francisco? Why, why not another state? Because that song, I'm serious about the song. I wasn't kidding you. That song was like, you know, that's where I want to be. That's where freedom is. That's where love is. That's, you know, like that. And uh, some bad thing had happened to me in France. I uh, suffered sexual violation in a very uh, difficult fashion, which I did a lot of therapy, so there is no need to like discuss on that. And I, um, I wanted out, I wanted to escape my, uh, you know, I was came from abuse. And then uh, so I was abused. And then I said, Okay, I'm going to escape this. And then I became a seeker seeking for what I really wanted. And that was the first thing I wanted. I was also, you know, 
interested in theater and the, the person that I knew in Santa Barbara was, you know, a teacher and knew about theater and things like this. So I had, I had, um, I had a place to land for a little while. And that's what happened in 1969. Well, that was a very tumultuous time to arrive in San Francisco. Tell us a little bit. It was, it was a great time. As far as I was concerned, it was a great time. <laughs> but a lot it was love, sex, and rock and roll. I mean, what else could you want well, at, at that time? You know? um, so I, I moved around. I met different people. I, I uh, you know, I, one time my bedroom was a, a janitor closet in a little hotel in North Beach. I followed somebody to a commune in Oregon with there was no no electricity, completely living, you know, uh, naturally. I mean, I did all kinds of things. Um, I and then eventually I ended back again in San Francisco. I'd gone through a couple of different lovers. I had done a lot of sexual experimentation in terms of free love. Um, and uh, and then I was in San Francisco and I had a lover named Bob Starfire who passed away to a, a heart issues. And he was an artist. He was very, very um, supportive, very, I would say he was submissive, but I did not know that. It was actually more into service than being submissive. And one day he said to me, oh, look, um, there is a program I think you'd love, uh, the Gorilla Grotto. And I said, the Gorilla Grotto? He said, yeah, yeah, it's that place near the head that is a, a play environment, you know, intellectual and books and theater and all that. And there is a program I think you'd love. And I said, okay, don't tell me, I want a surprise and I'll go with you. So I went with him and that program was the first uh, open talk by a SM woman named Cats in Love, who is still in love, who is still alive, who was a journalist for the Berkeley Bob and the Spectator magazine actually, I think. And a wonderful young blonde, very well spoken. And she was talking about erotic dominance for women running the show in the bedroom and how, how with consent we could do all kinds of things and negotiation. And it was just like uh, the light went boom in my head. And she emphasizes that because this was really uh, the date on that, which I had written someplace, but I cannot remember exactly. I think 81, uh, 1981. Um, that there was a society called the Society of Janus, and that, that was started by a woman, Cynthia Slater, and if, I, and if anybody in the audience right there was interested in exploring this erotic venue of power exchange, that it would be the right thing to do would be to join Janus because we, I would need, we would need to learn a lot of things so that everything was consensual, negotiated, people would not get hurt, safety. And I just went, wow, I'm in. I think I joined, uh, I, there was an orientation and I joined Janice pretty much the week after. And I, Please, that's how it started. Take a moment to explain to the audience what the Society of Janice is. The Society of Janus is still happening, even though I've not been to any of that event in a long time. Both Fakir and I and many of our friends are all uh, in their Hall of Fame. It's the second American association for um, about BDSM, about what was then called SM, about education. And the first one was TESS, or Roland Spiegel Society in Janus in uh, New York, and then the Society of Janus in San Francisco. It was started by Cynthia Slater, and 
a partner of hers who I didn't meet, and I actually do not recall his name at the moment, but she was the one who was mainly active. At the beginning, it was very much a gay group. Uh, people like Guy Baldwin were involved in it. Um, and Chris Bannon, or, you know, it was the beginning of it. She, she was bisexual and she invited a gay man that she was close to, who were friends, and one of, her, one of them actually was her lover, and that was the owner of the catacomb. She invited them to uh, give program. So my first, uh, sharing, sharing about the lifestyle, what worked for them. It was not classes. They were not really classes. They were more sharing time. And uh, so I went to all of these things. And that's, and the society still exists. It's called Society of Janus. They still have orientation. And of course, you know, with COVID, a lot of things went online. But she, it's, um, it's, uh, I learned a lot from attending meeting, watching demonstration. In fact, that's even where I met Fakir. So one thing to understand is we're talking about the early 80s to mid 80s. And during that time here in San Francisco, everybody knew everybody. Everybody was into SM because it was not called BDSM. And actually there were this discussion about DL, should it be more DL, should you? I have the whole collection of all their newsletters right there in my office, every single one. And uh, we all knew each other. And a lot of these people were gay men who I um, fetishize, uh, was really uh, love uh, getting to know, felt it with, enjoyed, respected. So that's really how, how my leather life started. And the reason why, the, the real reason why the light went up in my head was really not that I saw that was dominant, which in fact I'm a switch like a lot of people. I'm way more picky about who I bottom to than who I would talk, but I'm a definitely a switch and value that, um, that, uh, that, those the reality very much, and I've learned a lot from them. That's but um, it's a reason why the light went up in my head is because the whole thing was about consent and negotiation. I went, oh my God, I have been going to all these sex parties that were called orgies at the time. And the people are very nice and nobody was doing anything wrong or bad. But there was no knowing the person. There was no discussion. They were just like, "Oh, you look, you look, you look hot. Can I, uh, can I get close to you? And then can I fuck you?" And that was it. And for me, there was something missing. And when I would discover that there was a place where people would negotiate, talk with each other, try things. It was, I was like a kid in the candy store. I wanted to try everything. And then of course, with Janus, this young man named Mark Joplin, who left us during AIDS, uh, was a friend of Fakir, but Mark approached me and he said, I want you to be my dominant. I said, oh, okay, I guess I better learn a few skills. And, um, you know, it was a wonderful playground. That's and of course, that, you know, that, that like goes on because then Mark took me to Catacomb and then I can talk about that if you want to. Yeah, let's take a step back though. You, you've, you've covered a lot of material and I think the audience would like to know a little bit more about Cynthia Slater, for example. Tell us a little bit about her. Why was she so important? She was so important because she was a creator of the Janus Society and she was strong. She was out there, very well spoken, and definitely dominant and a good organizer. And uh, you could not not know her. Uh, Cynthia Slater was Cynthia Slater. There was also others like Pat, Pat Califia at the time and Gail Rubin. See, 
all of these names, Mark Thompson, Pat Khalif Shagarimar, all these people, we all were part of the same bubble for a while, or the same circle. And um, Cynthia was lover with the, the owner of the first Calico. She was lover with Steve. So you see, she invited Pat to the Calico, and Pat had a party there. And then Mark Joplin invited me because you only could go if you were invited. And you had to, it was very protected environment in that, that you couldn't just show up, you had to reserve. There was a call list, you had to be invited. And um, I don't know what else to tell you about it. It was a magical environment. But Cynthia had her feet in all of this, all the aspects. And she was a mistress and the mistress, and she was a very well-respected mistress. So she also, you know, left us uh, to AIDS, and that's what got her. But I had the privilege to know that wonderful woman. You've mentioned the catacombs. Uh, for the sake of the audience, would you please explain what they were? I can explain what they were, but if I, I hope that you don't mind my, my extrapolation. There is a book. This book is called Different, no, it's called Leather Folk. Okay. By Mark Thompson. This is the whole history of the beginning of the movement from San Francisco to New York. Gail Rubin wrote the entire piece on the catacomb with details. Right. That book you can get online if you are really interested. It is marvelous to see how everything got created. So the catacomb was not open to everybody. It was a little club. Actually, Fred called it the club. I didn't go to the first uh, um, the catacomb, because I was in a different location. Steve was um, Fred Haram's lover, died of a heart attack. And the catacomb went silent, didn't exist for a while. Wow. And then Fred reopened it. Mm -hmm. And he reopened it on Shotwell Street in 1982. And that's where I was invited to. Um, I was welcome there for a few months for the Saturday night parties, which was actually Gail wrote in the book that my private name is Carla. She wrote Carla was the only woman I turned into catacomb. And eventually Fred asked me, I can, we can, I can talk about what it was like in a moment, asked me to not come on Saturday because some patron wanted only mail space. But he said, I will give you my list, which was like extremely generous. He gave me his entire list of phone calls because you had to call people and see if they were coming and they had to reserve. And he said, call them all and create your own party. And you can also invite whoever else you want to invite and you can do it on Fridays once a month. Oh. So Mark Joplin and I organized our own party, and we called them, uh, what did we call them? The Serpent Mountain for SM, Serpent Mountain. So it wasn't the catacomb, but it was in the same location. Now, to get back to catacomb. So you had to have reserve. Um, there was a bar area where everybody's nails were being checked. So nobody had uh, unfisting nail at the time because at that time we were not using gloves at all. It was just before a before head stroke. And the activity that were going on there were um, flogging, spanking, uh, improvisational weird funny stuff. There was a great sense of humor and, ma and mainly fisting. And as far as a great sense of humor, 
that Fred had when I attended the catacomb, uh, at midnight, they would play the Alleluia Chorus, disco version, the handle, Alleluia Chorus, and everybody would get whipped if they weren't busy getting fisted. <laughs> but um, that's really where I met Gail Rubin, and I met Pat, now Patrick Califia, and other people who may not want their name out, but I know those two, their name are really out. Um, about the sense of humor, I remember one specific Saturday night where I was, I had my legs up in the air and Fred who was so incredibly charming, all we were wearing shops and the top harness, came up to me with this pig made of a candle. So it was a pig candle about this size and put it between my legs. And went up to the stereo and started playing baby crying and saying, she had a baby. And this was this, this silly pig uh. made up of candle, a little candle pig between my legs. I was just laughing and laughing. There was a, an amazing sense of camaraderie there. Yeah. And also, for instance, my first feasting was uh, an, another man who disappeared because of AIDS who just, he was in a sling, he, he, there was nobody playing with him and he saw me and he said, i never forget, he said, hey lady, come on over here, you have small hands. And I'm going, uh, uh, I don't know what to do, don't worry, I'll tell you exactly what to do. <laughs> and I just said, oh, okay. <laughs> Wow. So I was adventurous. Mm -hmm. And and the sense of connection, you know, it was a place for really intense sensation where some uh, enhancement used, for lack of a better word, yes, our drug were not permitted, but definitely some enhancement were used. Um, and the sense of connection with people was amazing. That is what got me. Um, another thing is because of the, you want to know a little bit more, because of the rape that I had survived when I was in France, to find myself in a sling um, as a bottom, and I would do both. To find myself in a sling at the hand of my boyfriend, Mark, and have other men standing around playing with themselves, watching, going, wow, a woman. There was such a sense of power. There was such a sense of being seen, a sense of there was nothing wrong. There was no shame. It was, uh, it was magical. Tell us about some of the other things you did at that time. You were very involved in the gay leather scene. That was the thing I did. I did think that I probably should not have done because there was no stopping me. Such as? There really was no stopping me. Such as, oh, you want three pieces of ID to get into the ambush, which was my favorite letter bar. Fine, I'll get three pieces of ID. It didn't occur to me that the three pieces of ID was because I would prefer that no woman be there. But then, you know, I dressed in leather. I was French, I still am French, but I'm American, but I'm French too. And I really think that kind of played in my favor. And I was friends with wonderful gay men artists, like Mark Chester, who was taking me to all these avant-garde gay theater events. And, you know, it was like art, sex, and, and my love of gay men. It was just like one big, and I saw some amazing artists in, that was part of the South Market culture. So those are the things I would do. Other thing I did was, because I did bottom, like Fred would frog me, and I actually bottom to gay men um, a whole lot more than to anybody else. I don't think I bought him to a straight man for like 10 years, <laughs> at least maybe even 15. I don't even think if I really bought him to a straight man, bisexual, yes. 
But okay, so even though I appeared, even with Fakir, like I wouldn't consider Fakir to be straight. I we appeared like a straight couple, but really, we were on the our consciousness and our way of thinking was much more queer and gay oriented than anything else. So that's why I say, well, that's another question you had, so I'll leave it. But, you know, thing I did, I did uh, after bottoming to gay men and needing to make some money, I thought, when I know of flogging fear, I have watched, and I watched all of this program in Janice, all of five years, they were not like program or two, they were more like, this is what I do, and this is how I do it. And if you want to do it, then be aware of this and that. Those were the learning experience. So I learned a lot from what you think Fakir was doing. I learned a lot about all kinds of stuff. And then I went, well, why don't I become a mistress? That's I can top straight guys. I would love stopping topping straight guys. I can do it. And boom, it worked. Let's take a, a step aside for a second before we come to Fakir, because that's going to be a lot of information. I found fascinating. I found fascinating that you were one of the first radical fairies. Please tell the audience what they were. What did they do? Ah, uh, okay, okay. Wait, there was a small issues with the world radical fairy on that. I was the first woman invited into Black Leather Wing. Okay. And Black Leather Wing was was the offshoot of the radical fairy. Oh, sorry. I got named you. by Harry, oh, please. Mm -hmm. Named by Harry Hayes, which a lot of people can research, who was, you know, a gay militant from the start, who one day said, hey, we need to welcome our brother with Black Leather Wing. And that's how the name Black Leather Wing became. And his quote unquote brother with black leather wing, one of them was Mark Thompson, who I had met, who I had actually met at the catacomb. And the other, another person who was Ganymede, was into piercing and a friend of Mark Chester. So everything crossed over, you see, because yeah. we all knew each other. So that's how, from the piercing world, of the piercing ritual, the beginning of the piercing movement, and and the radical fairy, my branch of game and I started knowing more where kinky radical fairy, aka people in black leather wing, who at that moment was a very gay group, which has shifted and is no longer a very gay group. It's more a, a home for leather, kinky, um, um, lesbian, genderqueer, trans. So it, it shifted through the years for many reasons, you know, including AIDS but what, and changes in, in society. What did the group do? What, what was their purpose? have a wonderful time, connect the spirit and the body and the sex and the power of orgasm. There was a certain sense of the spirit <laughs> that body and spirit connect and that orgasm and sexuality is a vehicle for that as well as SNM. So ritual experiences through intense ritual of flogging, piercing, fisting, etc. So that's what the group did. And we had a wonderful evening that were organized um, and also the respect of others. So there was a sense of spirituality that was definitely not Christian, okay? Mm -hmm. There was much more weaker oriented or respect of spirit per se. Mentoring was a very important part of your world. You've spoken of several people who were mentors to you. Talk with us about mentoring in the 
gay community, the leather community. Okay, so here is another another piece that is a little bit twisted. <laughs> um, really, the only mentoring was not an organized thing for me as you take classes and I'm going to see that you can do this or you can do that. It was much more of a natural process. I became very close friend with Mark Thompson, the guy, yes. wonderful writer, who wrote Gay Spirit, Gay Body, you know, and who is no longer with us, unfortunately, um, passed away a few years ago in Palm Spring. I think he was really the one that was the most my mentor. We had many conversations. And is he also was a very became a very close friend to Fakir. So Mark was my mentor. Fakir was my mentor by the fact of becoming my partner and me participating and then doing with him, expanding and doing working with him in different uh, tribal sort of ritual that we were doing, which we did actually in Europe and all over uh, many places in, in the state. So this was a kind of mentoring that I was receiving. I could say Fred of the Catacomb was my mentor by the way that he treated me and the way that he would joke with me and make me see bigger than myself. But it was not mentoring the way that he got organized letter for people. Okay. I hope this is not disappointing you, but no. that's the fact. Okay. What are your? It was more mat mattering by, by watching being, being in a relationship with people rather than, a set of things that follow the progression. What are your personal feelings on mentoring in the current community? I don't know if I can really answer that question. I think that there is probably some people who are fabulous mentors. I know that Patrick Mulcahy, who was uh, involved in the mentoring, is an amazing master. Um, and I'm sure that the mentoring he did, because he moved, I don't know if he's doing it right now. And people like uh, um, Skip, uh, Master Skip, I think those people would be amazing mentors and are if they are doing it. In terms of what else, I don't know. So I just start to say, I don't know. You know, like Tony Dublas, you know, Tony Dublas was also an amazing mentor in some ways. Um, but it was such a way of living in the moment and picking things up rather than organized mentoring. So I really cannot talk about that. That's okay. I don't have enough information. That's fine. Let's come to probably one of the most important parts of this, and that was Fakir Musafar. First, tell us who was he? To me, Fakir Musafar was a man that I met at the chateau. So chateau I uh, was, hang on one second, please, excuse me. Okay, the chateau was a BDSM place in San Francisco where professional mistresses, which was very few at the time, uh, would see clients. Oh. And Fakir was invited there to give a program. And his program were whatever it is that he wanted to share with people. And I remember him standing there. I don't remember if he was wearing leather pants or not. But I remember that he had large little tubes in his nipple, long tubes like this, about that size, actually. Mm. And he took him out and he said, and, I, and us were watching him, were actually standing up. And he said, is there any, any of you want to put their finger through my nipple? Well. Of course, I said yes. Ah, and I stepped forward and I put my finger through his nipple, like this. And symbolically, it was interesting because we got married, you know, many years after that. I wasn't really attracted to him, 
but he was fascinating me. I mean, the whole thing was, you know, the first photo of him I saw, he was decked out as a Christmas tree with balls, Christmas balls, sewed on for the Janus newsletter. And I never forgot that. So the Janus newsletter was an important piece of his journey. Mark Joplin was helping Fakir do the Janus newsletter. Fakir was, quote unquote, in his straight life, an ad exec executive. Oh, okay. Not for a newspaper that I will read or magazine, for the budding Silicon Valley industry. So they were industry paper, industry ads for the beginning of the old computer thing. Right, because he lives in Palo Alto, where I am right now. So um, Mark would come and I would do the Janus newsletter. And then Mark wanted me to be his mistress, and I was doing my best to learn to be a mistress. And I knew he knew Fakir. And then people started dying. A struck. Mm. And it was, you know, this is being. I hope that people will not forget. Um, people will be young and six weeks later they'll be old and then two weeks later they'll be dead. It was amazingly difficult uh, grief time. And the part of me, I knew when that Fakir was connected to body is a door to spirit. I knew that because I was one of the things that a few things he would say, you know, he really was a teacher and he would say over and over, no matter what is a doctor spirit and the only thing is to not want to know. Those were the two things that were his words that I imprinted in my brain forever and in my heart. And he, um, I told Mark, I said, Mark, I want to do a ritual. And the only person that can help with that is Fakir. So can you help me make that happen? And he said, yes. And I met with Fakir personally, not as a, not as a person watching his shares with the community. And I just say, you know, <coughs> I want to do, like because I was raised Catholic, I want to do a little road with sticks and photos, Polaroid photograph of all the people that have just died on one side. And then on the other side on sticks, so the photo are on sticks, so I can see them. On the other side, I want photo of the one I'm afraid of losing. And of course, Mark was in that. And, Ma and Fakir said, sure, I know a place where you can do that. And, and I said, I want to get peers so that I can, feel all the sensation I want to have balls all over my body, like your Christmas tree thing. And he said, sure, absolutely. I have the balls right to do anything. I know a place to go in the country. I have a car, I have a van, we can all go together, no problem. And we set up a time and we went up there and I did the first ball dance ever, beside the one that he did. And he was honored as could be that somebody would want to tie his stuff. And it was super powerful because we didn't, uh, we, he pierced uh, with uh, uh, sutures, sutures and then ties the bones on. So the more I would move heavily, the more the ball would eventually fly off. Like, so it was an amazing deliverance. It was just, a, perfect ritual. And actually, I'm writing it in my book. Um, there was a freedom that I had the, the blessing to experience that I just wish others could. And, you know, so I do the ball dance, I'm crying and screaming and running and dancing and jumping. And then the ball are all flying off and uh, Fakir is watching for safety. And Mark is playing the drum. He already had a patch on his eye because there was a disease that if you didn't wear a patch, you couldn't function. And that was maybe a couple, couple of months before he died. And 
then I'm completely high and the sun is still up in, in the sky and it's warm and there's a blanket there and I should, you know, there's, I brought some lube for whatever reason. And I say, well, you know, I'm completely high and this is my church. And would you fix me right there under the sky? And Fakir stood a few feet away playing the drum. And it was, the whole thing was perfectly balanced. It really was church to me. Wow. And, and then I had a connection with Fakir. And then when Mark, I stopped wanting to be, have any physical, sexual connection with Mark. And eventually, and he was okay with that because I was too afraid of getting AIDS, and he, which I was so blessed I didn't. And then eventually I just said to Mark, uh, you know, I really would like to date Fakir. Is that okay? And he said, sure, yeah, I would be delighted. And unfortunately he died uh, in 89 before, uh, before my engagement to Fakir, who married me in 1990. You and Fakir did a lot of work together and then you've done a lot of work on your own. Tell us about a few of the things that you taught. Am I making those noise or this noise in the computer? Am I the one making them, no? I don't hear anything. You don't hear them? Oh, God, I hear crack, crack, crack in my ears. Oh, it's a ear thing. Um, as long as you don't hear it, we're good. Um, Let's start that question again so we can edit. Please, please. You and Fakir did a lot of work together, a lot of education. Tell us a few of the classes you taught. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it, for me, there was a progression. I started to be asked to teach in San Francisco, my own classes. And I develop, I would develop subjects like, you know, the magic of flogging, uh, taking somebody, letting your beast out. I would develop your subject and work on them and present them with demo. And that's how I started my teaching. And because there wasn't that many women doing that, I was really very popular, like Stormy Leather, their shop would ask me to teach and House of Differences, which was a kinky Airbnb who asked me to teach. And then the letter conferences would ask me to teach. Um, NLA, you know, all of living in leather and all of this stuff. And then when I got together with Fakir, he knew that I could do public speaking and help. And he was very interested in how we could work together. And he is take on it was ritual work, doing, presenting thing from a ritual standpoint with, and community works, things that, so we did a whole lot of, of work with the safety of piercing, of breathing, being present and traveled with all these things and brought it to different community. Um, and the main thing that we did over and over was energy pool with needles. So pulling a needle at the heart chakra, we did a lot of working with the chakra system. Um, and then with hooks. And then we started bringing that to different level conferences like Thunder on the Mountain or people in Europe or people, the trip in Europe was like amazing or also in Arizona, and that became um, taken by the apex of the power exchange in Arizona, it became the dance of soul. So those were things that we did, or I would help him with other subjects he wanted to present, and then present my own as well, working with archetypes. So it became 
it became a big array of different things that I was comfortable with at the time. I always get a little, you know, afraid when I when I would get started, but I would I would own my own material and my main focus on everything was respect and presence, to be present, to watch the energy. So when I talk about bodies and to spirit, which I really believe for myself having done all this ritual, is really about energy, how energy work. And I would do funny thing, I tell people, you know, if I was in, not into energy, then I would just as well flog my desk because it doesn't give any energy back. What I want is to be in the loop, send the energy and have it come back, back and forth. So that's the kind of work that we did together had to do with energy and community. And uh, if I was a very loving person, you know, he kind of, because he had tremendously intense out of body experiences oh. when he was young. And you know, there's a lot of stuff on you. You know what? Maybe I should talk. Can we cut? Cut. There's diving nuts. The noise in there. Oh, okay. Cut. Cut for a second. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? I hear you. Okay. So let's start. So we had to. Let me put them away. I can hear you on the computer now. Okay. Uh, I don't know what, where, where should I put them far away? I think I have to put them far away. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry, I was making a lot of noise in my ears. No problem. We can edit. So, okay, so. go ahead. Um, you mentioned that Fakir had out of body experiences when he was young. When he was very young, actually, all that stuff is on YouTube, if people are looking up. He, he had one when he was in his teenage, living at his parents in South Dakota. He, you know, he lived near a American Indian reservation. So he was inspired by that culture. He really liked the American Indian a lot more than the white people. And he uh, tied himself up to uh, the basement, I actually went there and actually saw the mark from the staple and hooked himself up in a way that he could not get free. And, if I, and his parents were gone for three days mm -hmm. and he had done all kinds of preparation and he actually had an out of body experience and he described it he described it exactly that he saw the cats walking around, he saw the town being quiet, he looked at his body from a distance, he was amazed, like this. So he had a true hobby. And then he went, he, he doesn't even know he managed to free himself. In his book, The Spirit Plus Flesh, there is an all explanation of that in a uh, I shouldn't be telling you about the book because there's only like very few left, but it's his art book, big book, very plus fresh. He, um, and then he was enamored of the Sundance and the O'Keeper, which he learned about when he was a teenager in South Dakota. So he experienced that suspension by hooks and he tried it at first with piano wire, there was no hooks. And eventually he had another amazing out of body experience, which was recorded in the film Dances Sacred and Profane, which is online, where he heard a voice that tell him, he said it was the biggest love he have ever felt. It was an incredible love, so deep, so, so uh, brilliant. And a voice told him, no, 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 you can't go there. Because if you go there, you are gonna, you cannot go back in your body. So you wow. have to come back down. That's recorded with Jim Ward. This Okipa was done with Jim Ward in 1982. Wow. And the film is called Dances, Sacred and Profane. And it is online. 
and uh, and also Paul King of the APP as copies of it. I have a few copies. Somebody absolutely want one. So so because of that, his heart was blasted up. It's like he loved everybody. You know, he really did. And community matters so much to it. Of course, when he was not very happy, when he couldn't deal with his computer and he would get very upset and he'd be screaming and cursing like a maniac, then he wasn't, you know, the whole loving person. But that's to do with his computer. Uh, <laughs> it's a, a movie that's being made about him. Tell us about that. Well, I contacted the person who is doing it and asked permission because it is at the very beginning of it. And the film is called A Body to Live In. It just started and it is not gonna be a documentary like Ken Burns. It's gonna be an art film. And the filmmaker who is making it, his name is Angelo Madsen Minax. He's a trans man was just being recognized for his movie who PBS bought and he got all kind of award. Uh, so Angelo Madsen Minax is working on this art film for Fakir called A Body to Live In. We think it probably, I hope it'll be done within a year. Oh, good. But, but it's, you know, filmmaker, artist, they're very particular about telling you about their project. They're just like, wait, you'll see it when it comes out, okay? You'll see, I said, why well, can I tell them for the LAM? He said, yes, the cat's out of the bag. So wow. Go ahead, you can tell them. So I had permission. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Oh, me too, I can't wait. So is there something else that... Well, I'm wondering yeah. what advice you can offer people who are new to the scene? Um, be true to yourself. If you have fear, I hope that your fear is not about being shamed because there is no shame about your fantasies. Um, do not let anybody tie you up unless you trust them. Good. Follow your intuition if you're topping or bottoming. And also learn from your elder. Basically, is that join your community. Be in community, because that's where the real learning is. To, so you're not isolated. Get out of the fucking computer and just go to heaven. Any big city in America has led an event. Unfortunately, we're coming out of COVID, so it's going to happen again. Go to conferences, letter conferences. Watch the people that have are presenter at those conferences. Pay attention to your reaction. The things you might see that you might say, uh-uh, not for me. Respect that. It's not, not everything is for you. See what resonates with you and, you know, learn to say yes and learn to say no. Very good. That's pretty much, um, yeah, how I would, I would do it. You know, I was teaching a class uh, for, I did it for 18 years. Yeah, I think so. Wow. Uh, a three-day class and then a weekend, a weekend course for, erotic dominance. And when COVID um, came, I decided, no, not with screen. This is this stuff is not for screens. It's for feeling the energy, the real interaction. And then of course we lost the citadel I did the class. So I said, okay, it's a different piece of my life now. I like my book. I'm not gonna teach the weekend intensive anymore. I will still do ritual. I love to do ritual work in my dungeon. Um, which my dungeon was my wedding present. Can you imagine? How wonderful. It, it was, and it's so beautiful in there. You know, we're on a computer, so I cannot give you a little tour because I'm not on a laptop, but it's warm and, and the equipment is, ooh, 
I love it. So working with couples, yes, I want to keep doing that. People that are trying to increase their intimacy or the quality of their play or start again because something bad happened and say, no, no, we're not doing that anymore. Yeah. So that that is something I am into doing besides writing my book and hoping to get a publisher. Um, Tell us a little bit. Go ahead. Tell us a little bit about your book. Well, my book is very much about what we just did here is to, okay. to show how coming from a place of being put down, misunderstood, abused, having the courage to, or the folly, <laughs> somewhere, there's always a little bit of folly somewhere, to step out and then find your way and find your people and and stay ethical and grow into your truth despite despite the difficulties you know there's price to pay like you know my sister our born again christian that said that uh, uh spending time together uh, is not going to be happening because you know they want to pray for my soul and they want me to repent uh but you know i still love them and it's too bad I kind of lost them that way. It happened to Fakir and his brother as well. So they, but to keep in integrity with what is driving us, what is the journey that we we need to go on to find out what is our life about? Yeah. Why are we here? And right now it's just, you know, with what's going on in this country, it's so difficult. I mean, I came here to escape, to have all of the, the horrible uh, politics that are happening now. Yeah. So staying focused on on our work, but my book is really about trying to inspire people and also tell them a piece of history that is gone, but it was here in San Francisco and I'm going to have photos and this and that, a piece of history that can inspire them for whatever their journey might be. So that's what it is. I can't wait to read it. I look forward to it. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. Well, I have to finish it first and find a, a, a publisher. So I hope that uh, I hope that we didn't forget anything that's of importance. I don't think so, but I no, not... LAM. I love LAM. You know, Fakir has his uh, he has a whole exhibit there, and I still have some stuff I want to give LAM and and. Um, yeah, Chicago, we were very well received and I loved going to that beautiful building and... Yep, the Leather and Archives and Museum, that's right. Yes, yeah, seeing that the history is being preserved, you know, to archive our history is really important. Absolutely. And our stories. And thank you for giving me the honor and the pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've had an absolute this has been fascinating, and I'm so grateful to you. So. Well, I'm grateful to you as well. <laughs> Thank you. I can't believe I'm able to see that on, on YouTube sometime. Thank you. <laughs> but Cleo Dubois, thank you very much for I'm participating welcome. in Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. And thank you so very much for running the chat and doing such a wonderful job and being so welcoming. Thank you. Thank you.